Welcome everyone to this week's Mountain West ATC Echo and I am excited to welcome Dr. Adam Lipworth, a good friend and colleague. Dr. Lipworth is Chairman of Dermatology at the Leahy Clinic in Boston, faculty at the med school at Harvard and a world-renowned expert in HIV dermatology and I really like this topic because I feel like it's something I need to continually review and refresh and could do better in clinics. So Adam, thank you for taking this on and I will turn it over to you. Sure, thank you so much again for having me. This is uh, part two of, the, of a four-part series on HIV in the skin. And we're going to be focusing today on drug reactions in HIV disease, cutaneous drug reactions primarily. Uh, no disclosures, but uh, we will be discussing some off-label use of medications. Uh, so last time we focused, we did a whirlwind tour all of HIV in the skin in the uh, uh, early epidemic or in the developing world and still sometimes in the U.S., but before the uh, pay for patients not on ART. Uh, we did that in 15 minutes. So we talked about opportunistic infections and AIDS-defining malignancies. We went through this list. We looked at a giant facial molluscum, a disseminated histoplasmosis. We talked about the differential diagnosis for umbilicated papules, all of which appear in HIV disease, and also how to differentiate clinically molluscum from those using that uh, white uh, core as a very specific feature for molluscum. Uh, we looked at severe seborrheic dermatitis and widespread tinea corporis and other dermatophytoses. And then we looked at a uh, capsule sarcoma, which we're going to revisit a couple times uh, during the course of this four-part series, it comes up in, in many different ways, that some of which might be a little bit surprising in the last talk, in the fourth, uh, in the fourth talk in the, uh, the series. Today, we're going to move over to the other side, uh, HIV in the skin in the age of antiretroviral therapy. And uh, today, we're going to focus on drug reactions primarily, focusing again on what's new, what's misunderstood, and what you can use in clinic today. Now, I'll show you this first case, and uh, it may seem at first like it's not terribly pertinent to practice, but there is a point here that is very pertinent to even today's practices. This was a patient I met in Botswana a number of years ago. Uh, she had a CD4 count of 260. She switched antiretrovirals two weeks prior, and uh, she said the previous drug had made her feel slow and sad. And she had no other drug changes, and she presents with a severe rash and pain all over as the reason for consult. So if you get your phones ready... The question I'm going to ask, this is the picture of her, and the question I'm going to ask is not what she has, but what drug is the most likely cause of the rash? Great. So the answer here is indeed nivirapine. As I said, I think there's two ways to get at this answer. Um, the reason this may not seem completely re relevant is that we don't use nivirapine very much, but I'll, I'll show you in a second why I think it is relevant to today's practice. Uh, so one way is just to know that, that first of all, this is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So severe, uh, this is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It's not quite the level of toxic epidermal necrolysis. But uh, one way to get at the answer is that is to know that nivirapine is by far the most common of the antiretrovirals to cause uh, SJS or TEN, relative risk of about 22 uh, relative to um, uh, baseline risk from, from all meds pooled. Um, the other way is simply that she felt slow and sad uh, from the uh, uh, from the previous med, and that was uh, favarins with the psychogenic side effects, and it was a natural switch to go from one N uh, NNRTI to another. Now, we don't use nivirapine very much today, so why am I including that in the talk now? Well, does she have any other risk factors for SJS and TN besides her exposure just to nivirapine? Um, so, I mean, independent of drug exposure, does she have another risk factor for SJS or TEN? Specifically, after you control for the difference in medication exposures, does advanced HIV disease correlate with a higher or lower risk of toxic epidermal necrolysis? So is it lower in that if your CD4 count is low, you can't make uh, TEN as easily, uh, and so it's protective? Or is it higher that the low CD4 count appears to be a risk factor for TEN? Or neither. The risk of TEN is determined by the drug exposure alone. These patients are exposed to more uh, culprit drugs, and that's why they get it more frequently only. So she does have a risk factor for SJS, and it is actually AIDS. So if you take, a, this is a large German uh, cohort, 1993, it's old, but it was done well. Uh, they found about a thousand-fold increased risk of SJS and TEN, and it was not fully accounted for by increased drug exposure. So it was not entirely because of the drugs that they were exposed to. Now, they all were exposed to drugs that caused it, but that did not account for the entire increased risk over the general population who are exposed to those same drugs. And more recently, the likely mechanism has been delineated. Um, this is by one of my colleagues, Dr. Saavedra, who I uh, used to be at the Brigham. He's now in Virginia, uh, and with a, a really wonderful group in Durban, South Africa. Uh, they found that depletion of the skin-homing CD4-positive, CD25-positive T-regulatory cells in the skin 
allows for unchecked effector action of the uh, effector CD8 positive action, and that's actually the effector of TEN. So as the CD4 count declines, the uh, risk of TN actually goes up. So the peripheral blood CD4 count does seem to correlate with this depletion of the of these the CD4 positive, CD25 positive, uh, cutaneous T regulatory cell population as well, and those seem to be protective against TEN. So as the CD4 count declines, the risk of TEN goes up. So we see TEN and SJS a lot in these patients with low CD4 counts. Uh, often in Southern Africa from nevirapine, but also from sulfa drugs, from other antiretrovirals, and then from other medicines that they may be on anyway, independent of their HIV, like allopurinol is a very common one as well. Uh, other antibiotics besides sulfa agents too. So these are all cases of SGS and TEN. This was another nevirapine induced one in a pregnant woman when uh, it was fairly standard to switch to nevirapine for pregnancy at the time. So that's a quick uh, rule and tour of SGS and TEN. Um, I'm going to ask you what this is in just a moment. This is, actually, I'm not going to tell you anything else about this case, these cases. These two are obviously different patients. They're not related to each other in any way, but they have the same rash, and you can see very similar features. So if you get your phones ready, is this a fixed drug eruption, erythema multiforme, acute generalized exanthemous pustulosis, or AGEP, drug-induced lupus, or linear IgA bullous dermatosis? Blinded here. And this is a, a clinical diagnosis, is the reason I'm asking it. It's based on morphology alone in this particular case. Okay, nice. It's a split as well, uh, but 40% of you were correct. This is a fixed drug eruption. So, what you see here in a fixed drug eruption, and it is, uh, and I'll explain why it's important in, in HIV in just a moment, are these extremely well demarcated, usually somewhat edematous plaques that have this. Uh, similar color to capuchies, actually. They are kind of violaceous to red-brown, and they're very round. The most well-defined of them, you can see, just have a beautiful, well-demarcated, very round border. They often affect the lips and the genitalia. Uh, what is unique about this eruption is every time a patient is exposed to the drug, the rash appears in exactly the same place that it was before. It's unally a single lesion, unifocal, but it's much more likely to be multifocal in HIV. Sulfa agents are a major culprit, uh, and uh, uh, patients with HIV, this mechanism has not been determined, but seem to be at higher risk for fixed drug eruption as well. Uh, it's usually not terribly serious, except that it's quite easy to, it can be painful, and it's quite easy to misdiagnose. So this is a patient over here who actually had been diagnosed with recurrent severe HSV labialis, HSV of her lips, because it kept coming back over and over again, and then healing on its own, and then coming back, and then healing on its own, and it just had happened that it was in her case, it took us a long time to figure out. It was every time she was exposed to a particular spice in a sausage that her aunt in Virginia used to make. Uh, it took us quite a while to figure that out. And But uh, if you don't notice here that it's perfectly round, in fact, she actually, her lips are not quite aligned in her normal uh, her, her normal facies. And so it's hard to see that it's perfectly round. But if you shift her lips over, over a little bit, you can actually see that it's a just perfect circle around, uh, inclu including both her upper and lower lips, which is quite classic for fixed drug eruption. And that's how we got to the bottom of this. But it's not uncommon for this to be misdiagnosed as severe recurrent HSV of the lips. And this is what she looks like when she is in between cases where she just has inflammatory, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation left behind. So we've talked briefly so far about SGS and TEN. This is another case here of a fixed drug eruption, less, a little bit less well-defined, but you can still uh, see the general shape. This would happen every time he had a, uh, a dentist appointment and he would get amoxicillin, that patient. Uh, we often think first about lipodystrophy when we're thinking about the, uh, uh, the effects of medications in HIV. Uh, we still do see this sometimes. It's mostly the older patients who are exposed to the older PIs and NRTIs. Uh, and I'll just draw your attention to two other manifestations of the lipodystrophy that I, I'm seeing problems with in our aging population now with HIV. Uh, so one, it can take out the fat pads on the feet, which can predispose to ulcerations on the feet. And then also the fat pads over the ischial tuberosities, predisposing to, uh, to uh, bed sores. So uh, just uh, be careful of pressure ulcers in this population who have been living with HIV for a very long time and have some degree of lipodystrophy that may otherwise be almost irrelevant. Most people don't mind so much on their buttocks having a bit of lipodystrophy, but uh, I am seeing now a number of pressure ulcers. Photoallergic and phototoxic drug react reactions. Um, so sulfa agents, again, are a major culprit here. When you're looking for this, this is, you know, this is actually very hard to tell when the patient's shirt is on. You really have to take the shirt off to see 
this pattern and to notice that it's only the dorsal forearms is a sharp cut off at the sleeve line, sharp cut off at the shirt line. And oftentimes if it's, a, if it's an acute process, if you have them lift their neck up and look underneath their chin, they'll be where there's a shadow under their chin, you will not see the involvement of the rash. Uh, you can see nicely here also in the shadowed areas underneath the, uh, the uh, palpebra, uh, there is no rash. So phototoxic and photoallergic drug reactions. It's actually been postulated that the, the virus itself might be a chromophore, might actually absorb uh, UVB light and, uh, and release energy in, in ways that can uh, damage DNA and cause an immune response. Uh, it's, uh, that's still quite theoretical, but it may not always be related to drugs. It might be the virus itself. The end stage of many of these, uh, these photosensitive reactions, whatever the cause, is something called chronic actinic dermatitis, where you get infiltrated facies, uh, or all the, all the sun exposed areas can be quite infiltrated with these papules full of lymphocytes. Um, and, uh, and it starts to blur the borders between the shadowed areas and the, and the exposed areas. Uh, we see this very often in Southern Africa, and actually have never heard a great explanation for why uh, certain, uh, the population in Southern Africa seems to get this much more than the States, and not just in Boston, where I am, where there's very little sun, but also in, in Atlanta and Florida and other places where there's uh, high HIV prevalence, but also lots of sunlight. Uh, I don't know the answer to why it seems more prevalent in Southern Africa. When I'm giving a talk like this to dermatologists, I focus on some fairly obscure and largely clinically irrelevant um, drug effects that, uh, that they can be tested on, especially when it's, uh, when it's the residents who getting ready for their boards, uh, things that we don't see very often anymore, uh, like periungal PG from indinavir, which multiple reasons why we don't see that anymore. But I always end by talking about uh, the Cushing syndrome from ritonavir, from the boosting agents ritonavir, and now from Cobisistat as well, which has also been reported a number of times, because this is the area where we as dermatologists can actually do uh, the most harm. Uh, with a single injection of intralesional triamcinolone, I've made somebody Cushingoid myself by accident with clobetazole. So just to know, because uh, other, other, uh, people other than dermatologists will often give topical steroids, you can cause Cushing's disease uh, with topicals alone in patients on ritonavir or on Cobisistat. Uh, so it's a way that we as, as practitioners in general can do harm, but it's usually the dermatologist that ends up doing this. So I'm always careful to stress this to the dermatologist. So this has been a uh, quick, very quick 15 minute whirlwind tour of SJS and TEN, fixed drug eruptions, lipodystrophy, phototoxic and photoallergic drug eruptions. Um, I didn't mention DRESS yet, drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Uh, it's, we saw it, used to see it a lot from Abacavir. It's not seen very often because we do testing, of course, now for the HLA B5701. Uh, but just keep it in mind with, uh, with some combination pills that have Abacavir in them now. And uh, longitudinal melanonychia with, from AZT, which we almost never see again. m also does can cause some hyperpigmentation of skin and nails. And then I always mention the uh, ritonavir induced Cushing syndrome, uh, Cobisistat induced Cushing syndrome as well. And then iris is not exactly a drug reaction. We're going to talk next time about, uh, about cutaneous forms of iris as well. Uh, so just briefly, where are we in this, in this series? We've talked about the marks of profound immunosuppression, which I think of as problems from lack of therapy. Today we did the cutaneous adverse drug reactions, which I think is problems from the therapy itself. And then we're going to move on next time to iris and skin problems from recovery. And then HIV dermatosis is relatively resistant to CD4 count recovery or problems despite recovery. So that's the overall, I haven't shown this to you guys yet before, but that's the theme of this, of this talk overall. Problems from lack of therapy, problems from therapy, problems from recovery, and then problems despite recovery. That's the organization scheme. So thank you all very much. I appreciate your attention.